On behalf of the UC Master Gardeners of Santa Clara County, I'd like to welcome you to Successful Vegetable Gardening, growing year round in Santa Clara County. Tonight's session is part five of our eight part series. My name is Sharon Erickson. I'm a volunteer here in Santa Clara County with the Master, Master Gardener program, and I'll be your moderator for tonight's session. The University of California Master Gardener program extends research-based information about home horticulture and pest management to the public. This course is geared towards residents of Santa Clara Cal County, California, where we have warm, dry summers and cool but not cold wet winters that allow us to grow vegetables year round. If you're from another area, you may find that some of our material may not directly apply to you. Planting times, local soil and climate conditions and common local pests may be different in your area. If so, there are master gardener programs all over the US and Canada that can provide advice appropriate to where you live. On the other hand, much of what we'll be saying tonight, we've been saying throughout this course is true for vegetable gardeners everywhere. So we hope everyone gets a lot out of the course. This eight part series began with a session on garden planning, followed by sessions on soil, seeds and seedlings, and water and mulch. Tonight's session on managing pests will be followed by sessions on cool season vegetables, and we'll conclude with two sessions on warm season vegetables. Your presenter for tonight's session <laughs> on managing pests is Louise Christie. Louise has been a UC Master Gardener volunteer since 2011. Take it away, Louise. Thank you, Sharon. Let's see, welcome everyone. It's good to have you here again, if you have been coming to the entire series. And if you're new, we are very happy to have you join us. Our topic tonight, as Sharon said, is managing pests. Compared to many other places, California has relatively few diseases and pests that are a serious problem in home vegetable gardens. But nonetheless, the issue of pest control comes up all the time. Some of the topics I'll be talking about tonight involve making difficult choices. One gardener might choose to trap and kill a gopher that is eating their carrots, and another might think that's a reprehensible step. However, not everyone is the same. Not everyone has the same abilities. Not everyone has the same level of dependence on their vegetable garden for food. Within the science of pest control and the regulations and laws of California, there are many safe and effective options. I will go into a few of these options tonight, and I'll also refer you to other resources where you can learn more. In classes six, seven, and eight, Candace and Karen will include more information about pests of specific vegetables. So if you're trying to learn how to handle the leaf miners eating your chard, I won't talk about it tonight, but don't worry, we will get to it. And certainly we can ask, answer questions at the end. The master gardener's approach is to encourage you to think of your garden as part of the greater ecosystem when making decisions about whether and how to control pests. Challenges are part of gardening, tolerating some losses, working around them, observing the intricate world that is your garden, researching and learning about your options for dealing with problems, all these will make you a better gardener in the long run. <clears throat> so here's an outline of our topics for tonight. I'm gonna to talk about what is a pest. I'll give you the general principles and methods of IPM or integrated pest management. We'll discuss beneficial insects and natural enemies. We'll do a brief look at vertebrate pests and we will conclude with perennial weeds and how to deal with them when preparing a weedy area for a new vegetable bed. So what is a pest? Here is one definition. Pests are organisms that damage or interfere with desirable plants in our fields and orchard landscapes or wildlands. And I'll add our yards. The key points here are that pests are organisms. They are living things. They are part of the ecosystem. Pests may cause significant damage, but they also might be just a nuisance. And that's something for you to decide. But first of all, we can't assume that all plant problems are caused by a pest. Many plant problems are caused by other factors, not caused by a living organism. 
For example, in the photo on the left, you see blossom end rot in tomatoes. It sure looks like a pest, but it is not. It is not caused by a pest. It is a cellular collapse resulting from a nutritional problem caused by irregular watering. In the second photo, the plant has died from cold weather that it couldn't tolerate. Again, it looks like it could be a pest, but it's not. It's a plant problem not caused by a pest. But it's true. A lot of problems with vegetable gardens are caused by pests. Based on the definition we saw, they are living organisms. So let's look at the major types. Many of these will be familiar to you from your own gardens. So this is a typical example of a pest infestation that a home vegetable gardener might see. These are a type of insect, aphids on charred plants. Not very appetizing, but an example of an insect. There are many, many insects that could be in our gardens. Not all of them are pests. The vast, vast majority of them are not actually pests. So this pumpkin plant is being damaged by a pest that is a fungal disease called powdery mildew. And you're probably familiar with that if you've been gardening in this area. Powdery mildew is just one example, but there are plenty of other examples of funguses that fungi that might show up in a vegetable garden. This strawberry is being damaged by a pest that is actually kind of mollusk, a slug. Snails and slugs are mollusks. This tomato plant is being damaged by a pest that is a type of virus, tobacco mosaic virus. There are plenty of microorganisms like bacteria and viruses that can cause problems in our gardens, but fortunately they aren't the ones you're most likely to encounter. We've had enough of viruses lately anyway. And there are other plants that can be pests. This raspberry plant is the brown canes. It is being damaged by a bunch of pests that are actually other plants, they're weeds. All the green in this photo, except the big leaf in the upper left, all the green stuff is weeds. Weeds compete with our food plants for sunlight, soil, nutrients, water, and space, and they are definitely a pest. A vertebrate pest is an animal with a backbone. This eggplant has been munched on by a vertebrate pest. In this case, the damage is very characteristic of a rat. Sometimes it's difficult to tell whether it's a rat or a squirrel or some other animal. It could be your dog, could be your family member. <laughs> These pests can also damage plants by digging and chewing or eating plants from under the ground, like ground squirrels or, of course, gophers. Um, I didn't mean to imply that your family members are digging but the gophers might be. So the point I'm hoping to get across here is that our gardens may be plagued by many, many kinds of pests from tiny viruses to undesirable plants to fairly big animals. But the other message here is that our gardens are full of all kinds of life. And that is a good and exciting thing to have lots of life in the garden. So we've talked about what pests are. Now let's learn a little bit about how to deal with them. I'll be talking about the principles and methods of IPM, which we call integrated pest management. But before we get into that, let's take a poll. So Sharon, could you launch our poll for us? If your finger hurts, what do you do? Launch your vote. We'll give you about 15 seconds or less. <laughs> okay. Are we about done, do you think, Sharon? Yeah. I think we, you've got your results. Shall I show you the poll? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. If you could read it off for people who are on YouTube. If your finger hurts, what do you do? One choice was put a Band-Aid on it and 28% of people thought, yeah, let's put a Band-Aid. One choice was take antibiotics, 2%. 
10% said soak it in ice water, 1% said call a doctor, 1% said amputate, they got the joke. 0% said take cough syrup, 8% said ignore it, and 82% said try to figure out what is wrong before doing any of the above. So I think it's pretty clear that we're trying to make a point here. <laughs> um, Obviously there could be many reasons why your finger might hurt and you'll take different actions depending on what the cause is. You, you might put a Band-Aid on it. Um, ice water might help if you burned it. If it's something minor like a hangnail, you probably just ignore it. And if it's serious, you would go to the doctor. You would, wouldn't take antibiotics unless you determined, you and your doctor determined that there was an infection and identified it and knew what it was and could, could find the right antibiotic. And you wouldn't take cough syrup because that's not going to help with your finger. So similarly with plants, we need to figure out what is wrong with them first before we start treating them. Otherwise, it's a waste of time and energy and money. And if we take the wrong steps, we might even make the problem worse. Integrated pest management is a set of principles and methods for controlling pests that was first used in agriculture in the 1970s in response to growing knowledge about the negative side effects of pesticide overuse. The main idea is to manage pest problems while minimizing the risks to people and the environment. So there's three basic components of IPM. First, you detect, identify, and monitor. If you can't detect a pest, the problem may not be caused by a pest at all, like I said early at the beginning. We encourage gardeners to acquire and learn to use a hand lens. Oh, shoot, I don't have my hand lens here. Any kind of a little magnifying glass or even one of those small portable loops. Um, those can really help you out uh, to identify pests on plants and seeing it with your own eyes is a really good place to start with identification. You might wanna consult with the master gardener help desk to help you identify pests, but definitely don't rush to action. Monitor the problem, observe the pest, watch what happens over a period of several days to really see what's going on. You wanna play detective. Look at those little pests, it's really kind of fun. Second, knowing the life cycle needs and behavioral habits of a pest will really help with finding the best type of control if you decide some kind of control is needed. For example, knowing that snails like to hide in dark, moist places, which is a behavioral characteristic, that knowledge helps you find the snails and get them out of your garden. To learn these things, you might need to do some additional research. And then the last component is choosing an ecologically sound pest management method and I'll go into that in more detail in a bit. So let's look at an example here. This is a typical example of pest damage that a home vegetable gardener might see. These caterpillars are actually causing severe damage to this fennel plant. You can't see any fennel leaves left here. I like fennel. I didn't really love that my plant was getting eaten, but these are the larvae of the anise swallowtail butterfly. If the gardener doesn't take the time to observe and identify the pest, they might destroy a species they otherwise would want to protect and enjoy in the garden, even though they might also be a bit of a nuisance. Here's another example. These green bean plants look unhealthy with millions of tiny spots and the plants are not growing very well. This is a very typical thing that you'll see on green beans. Especially kind of later in the season. We can identify the problem, it is spider mites. We can do that by looking at it with our hand lens. You can see the little spiders crawling around, spider mites, and there's often a little bit of webbing. Let's see, in the second photo, the mite on the left is a Western predatory mite, and it is eating the mite on the right, which is the kind that is causing the problem. So the conclusion is, if you used a pesticide, you would kill both mites. Mite infestations on plants can actually get worse after using pesticides because the predatory mites are killed. 
And if there are any of the pest mites left, they will reproduce and then you're gonna have a bad problem again. A little more research tells us that mites prefer a dry, dusty environment. So we can choose the ecologically safe option of spraying down the plant frequently with water to keep it moist and to remove the dust. And that'll discourage the mites without killing the predatory ones. So the predatory ones can stay around and eat the others. So how do we learn more about these pests? I want to introduce you to the UCIPM website. UCIPM is a science-based comprehensive resource on plant pests for everybody from big ag farmers to home gardeners like us. The page shown here is about squash bugs and you can see it has information about what it is, its life cycle, the damage it can do and some solutions for controlling it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Excuse me. So to demonstrate how to use this site, I'd like to preview your homework for next week. We're going to ask you to look up a cool season vegetable you'd like to grow and use UCIPM to investigate one of the possible pests. So I'm gonna go do that now. Let's see what happens. Excuse me, I just had... Okay, so let me... Oh, Zoom, please cooperate with me. Okay, this is the UC Master Gardener website and I am going to go over here and look at the vegetable planting chart. And this is that amazing tool that we use all the time for growing vegetables around here to help us know when to plant them. So I'm scrolling down and I want to choose a plant that I could put in the ground now in March. So I'm looking at this column here March. And this is what we want you to do sometime between this week and next week is go look at this chart and choose a vegetable that you're interested in growing, a cool season one that you could plant in March. So I'm going to go down and choose lettuce. So here's lettuce. I, can, I see I could transplant or direct seed lettuce in March. So I'm going to click on lettuce and it takes me to some information about lettuce. And I can go right here to the pest management for lettuce. And notice up here, I am now on the UCIPM site. So that's one of the things master gardeners do all the time. We spend half of our time on UCIPM. And here's lettuce, tells me about the plant, tells me some cultural tips for it. That means, cultural means growing it, how to grow it. But over here on the right, you can see all kinds of pests and disorders of lettuce. So your homework, and I'm doing it now, is to choose a pest and learn a little bit about it. So let's choose snails and slugs in this case. And you get a huge amount of information about snails and slugs, probably more than you ever wanted to know, about their identification, their biology, some good pictures of them, the damage they can do, and especially some things about how to manage snails and slugs. So I can see that uh, one of the things I can do is I can get rid of the places that they like to hide, eliminate the places where snails and slugs like to hide. So that's one of the things we can do to get rid of snails and slugs. So that's your homework for next week is to do something like that. And I will go back to my slides now. Let's see if this is the right one. Sharon, are you seeing the proper slide? Not yet. Do this twice. Now we're yes. Yeah, oh, so wait. Then I think yeah, you need okay. to go to presentation. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Do you and, see more on the IPM process? Yeah, but we're seeing your whole slide deck. Ah, okay. So if you could do the presentation. I knew this was going to happen. 
we bear practiced, with us, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> the Zoom and the internet gods. How's it now? We're on the IPM process. Okay. Perfect. So again, your homework next week is go use the UC IPM site. Explore it. It's wonderful. There's a ton of great stuff there. So let's see. What we want to do is we want to choose an ecologically sound management method. And the IPM site we just visited will help you do that. Um, I talked about detecting, identifying, and monitoring, understanding life cycles, and then choosing that method. But there are now four basic categories of methods that you could choose. One is um, cultural control, how you take care of the plants from watering to weeding and fertilizing and that kind of thing. There's also physical and mechanical types of control that you can choose, which is usually using some kind of a barrier to keep the pest away from the plants, but there are lots of other physical or mechanical ways of dealing with pests. Biological control means taking advantage of predator prey relationships in the garden, basically so that one type of organism kills or interferes with another. And then chemi chemical control is the use of pesticides and herbicides. So we're gonna talk about these four categories of pest control in a little more detail. So the example that's, that we're, we'll be talking about right now is insect type uh, pest control. So cultural methods that we really want to use to deal with insect pests are watering correctly. Don't stress your plants or encourage fungal growth or um, crowding by having the leaves wet for too long. I think I said insect control. I'm really talking about um, insects, fungus diseases, and that kinds of thing. I'm going to go to other kinds of major pests later. Um, another cultural method that we can use for pest control is to keep your plants strong, healthy, and happy. Plant them at the right time, give them good care, uh, give them lots and lots of sunlight, Remember from class one, Karen emphasized that vegetables need six to eight hours of direct sunlight. So without enough sunlight, they will be weak and weaker plants attract pests. Um, you do wanna make sure that you um, plant at the correct time of year. For example, if you plant chard and kale in the fall, going into the winter, you'll have fewer problems with leaf miners or cabbage worm. For fungal and viral disease problems, you wanna consider choosing disease resistant varieties. And I'll talk about those a little bit more in a sec on the next slide. Um, you can interplant flowers and herbs and other kinds of plants in with your vegetables that can kind of confuse the pests. If all the plants that the pests want to eat are placed close together, it's easier for the pests to find them, right? And move from plant to plant. So mixing flowers and veggies makes a beautiful landscape and it attracts beneficial insects. You could even consider that a form of companion planting. <clears throat> Things you don't wanna do, don't over fertilize. That creates lush growth that the insects love to feed on. Don't crowd your plants. You want them to have good air circulation to prevent fungal diseases. And clean up plant debris at the end of the season to help remove the pests that overwinter like flea beetles, squash bugs, and cucumber beetles. So I talked, to, I mentioned resistant varieties. So here on this slide, you can see um, two different ones. It, it's not always possible to buy a plant variety that is disease resistant, but a lot of them have been bred that way. Um, for example, in Santa Clara County, zucchini is very susceptible to powdery mildew. But if you plant a disease resistant variety, it'll result in a healthier plant that will last longer and probably yield more than if it became diseased and died halfway through the summer. Using disease resistant varieties can be especially helpful for beginning gardeners to prevent you from becoming discouraged and help you achieve veggie gardening success. Here's an example of a listing in a seed catalog of two varieties of zucchini. The one on the top says <clears throat> IR, PM, PRS, WMV, ZYMV. See if I can get my, ooh, I can do this. It's right here. Those are the plant resistance. So um, the R stands for resistant. I'm not sure what the I stands for. The PM is for powdery mildew. 
So that's the one we want. The others are great. Uh, and the, they're all viruses. This is a V ends with virus. I don't know these viruses, but I'm getting some virus resistance in addition to powdery mildew resistance on this one. And um, you can also see that this other variety down here, Raven, does not have any disease resistance. So in my garden, the one at the top would do a lot better than the one at the bottom because it would be resistant to powdery mildew. Uh, you may notice that both varieties are F1 hybrids, just an interesting point there. So those are some cultural things we can do to deal with some pests. Um, the next kind of category is physical or mechanical control. So um, even, but let's see, I'm trying to think of what I was gonna do here. Some examples of physical and mechanical methods that you can use are to use row cover. I knew I had something here. So hope you can see this, this is row cover. And I've got just a little tiny piece here. You can use row cover, but you'll use it in a smaller scale than like in this photo. And um, it's really good for keeping pests off of plants. The plants just grow right up underneath it. You do wanna to, um, put some soil or rocks or something around the edges to keep the pests out of the side. Another physical mechanical thing you can do is you can wash the pests off with a strong stream of water. You can physically knock them off the plant. That can be really effective uh, for aphids, for example. You can hand pick larger insects like squash bugs. If you know what the eggs look like, you can even squish the eggs. Be sure you don't squish some desirable eggs, um, but definitely something like squash bugs or snails, you can just pick them up and, and squish them. Traps are a physical or mechanical method also. Um, a good one is tanglefoot. It's a sticky substance that you can use to trap ants and keep them out of your citrus trees, for example. Ants actively protect aphids, scales, and whiteflies because they eat the honeydew that those pests produce. I see this on my lemon tree all the time. You can effectively control ants by using tanglefoot around the base of the tree. Um, you can also use ant bait stations. When ants are controlled, then they no longer protect those honeydew producing insects. And um, those, those insects will then be attacked by their natural predators. You can also use traps for snails and slugs and some other insects like earwigs, which sometimes are a problem in the garden. Um, you might've heard of the trick of rolling up some damp newspaper and just lay that in the garden and earwigs will crawl in that. And then you can just pick it up in the morning and toss it in the trash. And then one thing I love to do is I like to go out at night, especially on, in weather like we've been having lately um, with a headlamp and a bucket. And I go out and I pick snails and slugs out of the garden. Um, nighttime is a great time to go out in your yard, go out in your garden, see what's going on out there. It's a whole different world. And um, when you see them eating your vegetables at night, then you'll really want to grab them and get rid of them. <laughs> so some physical mechanical things you can do. Uh, the third category of pest management is biological control. That means introducing parasites, pathogens, and predators into the garden. Basically, you're recruiting one life form to control another, like I said earlier. The most important version of biological control in our vegetable gardens is encouraging natural enemies, as shown here with this lady beetle, which is eating an aphid. And we'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. Um, you may be curious about buying predator insects like lady beetles, mantids, or lace wings. Insects that, insects that you buy in containers um, are generally stressed and dehydrated from shipping and sitting in the store. They're not very healthy. Some of them like mantises are generalist predators and they'll just eat anything, the good insects too. Lady beetles, which are collected and, and put into those packages, they're collected during their hibernation phase. So they instinctively fly away when they come out of hibernation. So they won't stay in your garden anyway, they'll fly away. So in general, buying and releasing insects is not an effective pest control strategy for the home vegetable gardener. Another form of biological control sometimes used in home gardens is using specific disease causing microorganisms. <clears throat> An example that you may be familiar with is BT, 
Bacillus thuringiensis, that is um, a bacteria. Some of those types of products will be discussed during some of the other classes when um, Karen and Candace are talking about specific vegetables where they might be most useful. And then if cultural, physical, and biological methods fail, you might choose to use a pesticide. There are a lot of pesticides available from those used by homeowners to those for which you need to be a licensed pesticide applicator. These pictures show some of the less dangerous pesticides of the kind you might find in your nursery or Home Depot or something like that. <clears throat> if you go this route, make sure to choose a pesticide that targets the pest you're having problems with. It would be a total waste to use something that is ineffective, kind of like using cough syrup for a, a finger that's sore, right? You need to make sure that you're, you're getting the right pesticide. Make sure you know what the active ingredient is. Many pesticides on the shelf in the stores contain multiple active ingredients, so be very careful. For example, some insecticidal soaps include not only soap, but also pyrethrins. The soap is a fairly innocuous in insecticide. Um, it kills the soft-bodied insects like aphids on contact. You apply the soap directly onto the target insects, but pyrethrins are broad spectrum plant-based insecticides, which will kill natural enemies um, and pollinators that might be present at the time that you spray. And the residues can continue killing insects that move into the area for weeks, even, even weeks afterwards. So it's best to pick a product that only contained the soap that you were looking for in the first place and skip the other one. In general, you wanna remember that insecticide compounds will kill beneficial insects as well as pests if they're similar in biology. For example, a miticide will kill all mites, good and bad. Soaps and oils like neem oil will destroy the eggs of all insects, good and bad insects. Plant-based insecticides like the pyrethrin I was just discussing will kill all insects, not just the pests. Also remember, just because it says organic or OMRI certified or that it is plant-based does not mean that it's not toxic at some level. If it kills things, it's toxic. Just keep that in mind. Doesn't matter organic or not. Sometimes a pesticide may actually harm some plants. So you wanna look out for that too. It would be a shame to kill a plant that you were actually trying to protect. And always check the application requirements. Like for instance, what time of day do you need to apply it? Is it applied as a spray or a solid? Do you need to dilute it? That kind of thing. Always buy the smallest amount that will do the job so you don't have any leftovers. And of course, check for any safety warnings and safety equipment that's needed. Do you have the proper goggles, gloves, a mask or a respirator that you might need? Um, you wanna be safe when you're applying the chemical, right? And keep in mind your children or your pets so you follow the directions exactly. I don't wanna imply that you should never have pesticide bottles in your garage. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but you do wanna buy the smallest amount. There are way too many garden chemicals available in the stores for us to cover everything tonight, obviously. Um, where we find some options particularly helpful, I'll either discuss them tonight or they'll get discussed in future classes. So um, I did ask you to think about or go out in your garage and see if you could find a, a pesticide container that you might have and take a look at it. So you might be looking at that now and, and kind of look at the label and see if you can see the active ingredient and that kind of thing. Or if you don't have it with you right now, you might take it, take it up this weekend or something and kind of start investigating those labels. The label is really important. Pay attention to the label. <laughs> Okay, so I think I've talked about that. Oh, I wanted to talk about active ingredients some more. When you know the active ingredient, um, you can look it up in the active ingredients database, which is also part of the UCIPM site. Uh, it's a really, really great site and um, will go straight to the active ingredient and give you all kinds of great information about it. About it. So check it out, um, check, check out your active ingredient on, the, um, on this website. It's really helpful. I just learned about it recently. 
So that's why I'm telling you about it. Okay, and a little bit about the lingo here. Um, insecticide, miticide, viricide, herbicide, rodenticide, all these sides, those are all pesticides. Just, just wanna make it clear. An herbicide is a pesticide, right? All of these are pesticides. Okay, so now that we know a little bit in general about how integrated pest management works, let's go deeper into one kind of biological control that is most useful in your home vegetable garden. And this is my favorite part, beneficial insects, attracting beneficial insects to your garden. So now we're going to hope that the Zoom and internet gremlins will cooperate with us. I am going to show the video that I asked you to watch. Um, again, because I think it's a fantastic video. Let me just make sure that I can find it. Okay, let's not do that. It might take a second here. Okay. All the things you have to click, right? Okay, share and interrupt if this is not working. Do you have lots of aphids uh, in your garden? And then full screen. If you do, mostly, and you may also find beneficial insects feeding on them. Lady beetles are voracious aphid feeders. Most people recognize adult lady beetles, but lady beetle larvae, which are unfamiliar to many people, also stalk and eat aphids. These tiny black lady beetles just hatched out of their eggs. They'll soon be off to hunt aphids. Another common aphid predator is the green lacewing. Adults have lacy green wings and golden eyes. They lay eggs on long stalks either singly or in clusters. Lacewing larvae are the primary predatory stage. Larvae are alligator-like insects that grab aphids with their pincher-like mandibles and suck out the aphids' contents. In addition to aphids, lacewings feed on many other small soft-bodied insects, such as scales, caterpillars, and psyllids. Surfid flies, sometimes called flower flies or hoverflies, feed on pollen and nectar. However, surfid fly larvae feed almost entirely on aphids. These pale, legless, caterpillar-like maggots are often found wandering in aphid colonies, seizing aphids and scarfing them up as they go. Many other predators also feed on aphids. Soldier beetles are very common aphid predators on flowering plants. Damselbugs feed on aphids, as well as many other small to medium-sized insects. Predaceous midges are very small maggots similar to surfids that can often be found feeding on aphids. In addition to these aphid predators or hunters, many tiny wasps kill and parasitize aphids by laying their eggs inside the aphid's body. Eggs hatch into wasp larvae that feed within the aphid and rapidly kill it. The dead aphid develops a beige or black crust called a mummy and the wasp pupates within, cutting a circular hole when it is ready to emerge as an adult wasp. Parasitic wasps and aphid predators frequently keep aphid populations at low levels, protect these natural enemies by avoiding sprays and insecticides that will kill them. See the UC IPM website for more information on aphids and natural enemies. Okay. Oops, I knew this was going to happen. <laughs> okay. YouTube is a very enthusiastic place and it always wants to keep showing. Go back to Zoom. Okay. So I hope everybody loves that video. I think it's fantastic. I've watched it a million times now and I still love the way it, it's very concise and it shows you exactly what we want to see, which is these beneficial insects munching on aphids and beneficial insects um, kill a lot of other kinds of, of uh, damaging insects in our gardens as well. So showing you the video um, lets me skip through the next few slides because I was going to talk about these things, but I'm going to go faster and just give you some real quick pictures to look at 
And since you saw the video, we don't need to talk about them too much, but we can answer questions at the end if you have any. So again, here's a ladybug eating a, sorry, lady beetle eating an aphid. Um, just wanna make sure you get a chance to see the difference between a lady beetle and a cucumber beetle. The one on the right is the cucumber beetle. It is a pest. Notice that the antennae on the lady beetle in the upper left is very short and clubby, and the antennae on the yellow cucumber beetle is long. So if you see this yellow bug with long antennae, that's a, an insect that you don't want in your garden. The lady beetle is one you do. And lady beetles come in lots of different, um, mostly, col mostly colors are red and black, but they come in a lot of different numbers of spots. So not just only you know, red ones with seven spots, but lots of different ones. And then this is a, a picture again of that um, larvae. If you see this in your garden, it's great. And you want it there and you want lots of them. And then he showed you the soldier beetle, which is wonderful. And the lacewing, that larvae again, is kind of like the one for the lady beetle, just a little different color. You want that in your garden. And the adult is magnificent and beautiful too. And then these are lacewing eggs. If you see them, that's a great thing. And then this is the same picture that he showed you of the surfid fly. In your garden, you'll see little, if you have beneficials, you'll often see little insects just hovering around like that. That's often the surfid fly or these other parasitic wasps. That little hovering is, is exactly what you want in your garden. So a little bit about the predator-prey relationship. Beneficial insects are predators that prey upon or parasitize insects that are harmful to our vegetable plants. Another way to think about it is that vegetarian insects want to eat your plants and carnivorous insects want to eat the other insects. The thing is that the plant eating insects will appear first on your plants. But as this graph shows, if the environment is right, after a while, the predator insects will come along and eat the prey insects, drastically reducing their population. As gardeners, we need to be a little bit patient and wait for the predators to show up and begin to control the prey. The graph also explains the possible downside to using pesticides. If while you're attempting to kill a pest, uh, you use you kill a pesticide that kills the predators, you can have a secondary infestation here that could be even worse than what you had before. Uh, you want to learn to recognize a few of the beneficial so you will realize when you use, when you see insects in your garden, they could very well be your friends. Um, but, but you need to let a little bit of the, of the prey survive to attract the predators, right? So this is, this is what I, what, what we, the point we want to get across is let some of the aphids survive. Don't jump to a solution right away when you start to see problems because the predators will show up or you hope that they will show up. And when they do, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, you may want to sacrifice one plant, right? Let one plant be the aphid nursery and knock the bugs off of uh, all the other plants, for example. Um, but definitely let some of the prey survive so that those natural enemies will have something to eat when they get to your garden. And this picture, you can see the lacewing eggs and they're eating these magnificently orange aphids. And then you can also see the surfid larvae um, eating some green aphids. So this is the part I love the most. To attract beneficial insects, grow flowers. They provide food, nectar for energy, pollen for protein um, for the little predator insects. And the predator insects come in different stages, right? They come in the larval stage and the adult stage and different stages might need flowers and different stages might need aphids. So you wanna have the flowers around. Try to have flowers blooming spring through fall in your garden. Year round is even better. You don't need to grow fancy roses. <laughs> Remember, beneficial insects are often very small. They appreciate flowers on their scale. They love plants whose flowers are compound or umbel shaped like, 
like an umbrella, right? That have many small flowers and a large surface like, like this. So this parasitic wasp in the picture is on one of these umbel shaped flowers. And there's a long list here of other great choices in, in, of flowers. Many of them are herbs. So if you grow herbs, the flowers of many herb, most herb plants are fantastic for attracting beneficial insects. Also small garden flowers like alyssum are really good. Um, what else is great? Cilantro, if you let cilantro bloom, it's fantastic for attracting beneficial insects. And then a ton of the native shrubs like uh, the buckwheats are really, really great for attracting beneficial insects to your garden. So grow flowers, grow lots of flowers. You'll, your garden will be beautiful and um, you'll get lots of beneficial insects coming into your garden. Another thing that you wanna do is um, arrange your garden so it provides a variety of habitats to attract not just natural predators, but all kinds of other beneficial insects and other beneficial organisms. Um, habitat could be like different kinds of plants, annual and perennial plants, not just only annual vegetables, lots of tall plants and short plants because the variety of life that you're trying to attract into your garden wants different variety of plants to live on. You want shady areas and sunny areas. You want some areas that have lots of mulch and leaf litter and some areas that are open and not disturbed. Um, not all beneficial insects are predators. Honeybees, native bees, and wasps, all of them have a role to play in our gardens too. So you want some bare soil to attract the native bees. They, a lot of them nest in the ground. Uh, you can see in this picture on the right, some piles of um, soil where the insects have dug in. So in the, and although we encourage you to use mulch, be sure to leave some areas of bare soil in your garden. And then the photo on the left shows a hummingbird attracted to a garden by lots of flowers and it has a place to perch. Hummers not only eat nectar, they also eat ants and aphids and fruit flies and mites and mosquitoes. They eat a lot of stuff, not just that liquid in the, in the hum hummingbird feeder. <laughs> and then another thing that you wanna do is um, all forms of life that you're trying to attract to your garden, they all need water. So provide a bird bath or, um, maybe a little creek if you're creative, you wanna set something like that up to uh, attract um, not, just the, not just birds, but also insects into your garden. Even just a little, little dish with some water in it can be really great. Um, I, many, many times in the summer, you'll see on hot days, you'll see bees um, and wasps drinking the water from something like a bird bath. So add water and you'll have more beneficial insects in your garden. So that was about beneficial insects, something I love to attract to my garden. It's wonderful. But next we're gonna talk about vertebrate pests. And we get a lot of questions about this. It is a problem in Santa Clara County and we'll try to cover a bit of it here. So these pictures show some of the kinds of damage that they can do. This is um, some rat damage to squash and tomato plants. So we're gonna go through just a few of the vertebrate pests you might be familiar with. Excuse me. You might have rats, Norway rats, roof rats, or little, little mice. They eat many garden vegetables all year round. In the winter, um, they like to eat the growing insides of, of green plants like lettuce and kale and collards. Um, they don't just eat tomatoes in the summer. So what you might do, like I did when I was trying to research rats, you might look up the Santa Clara County vector control because rats, right? They will do a free inspection and recommendations if you suspect rat infestation in the house, but they will not help you with garden issues. I was kind of surprised about that. Um, but one thing you might want to keep in mind about rats is that they will eat snails and slugs. So it's possible that your population of snails and slugs might go down if you have rats around. Depends on what you want to do about these things, I guess. 
Uh, you might have other kinds of vertebrate pests. You might have gophers or squirrels or birds or ground squirrels. Um, in the early fall, the squirrels are very active and they like to bury nuts in your freshly planted garden beds. And then in the spring, when they're looking for the nuts, then they'll be digging things up. Ground squirrels and tree squirrels are a problem in our area. And squirrels will also eat vegetables and all kinds of fruit. Um, birds can be a pest. This picture of this bird is, it's shredding the lettuce leaf that it's, it's standing on. Birds love lettuce and they really love lettuce seedlings when they're tiny. Um, especially in the springtime. Oh, and pea shoots, they love pea shoots too. So um, that's where this row cover can come in handy. If you just put this over your lettuce seedlings or your other seedlings that can keep the birds out. Sometimes birds will even watch while you're planting the seeds. And then when you go inside, they'll come and eat the seeds. Um, and of course there are other vertebrate pests, gophers, voles, sometimes even cats and dogs can be pests, right? So those are all vertebrate pests. Again, we can use the integrated pest management principles and the four categories of control. Identify and monitor the pest. <clears throat> you want to be sure what you're dealing with. Um, it'll help you decide what level of damage you'll tolerate and then what methods of control you're going to use. For instance, if your dog is eating your tomatoes, a rat trap won't be the solution. And I, I have a friend whose dog just goes out and just takes the tomato right off the plant. Cultural control methods you can use, keep your plants healthy and strong. Again, they can hopefully grow faster than the pests will eat them. Keep the plants far away from pest highways like the fences and the gutters. Keep, you know, make it difficult for them to get to the plants. You can remove habitat like piles of brush or overgrown bushes and ground covers that shelter those critters. Rats love to nest in ivy, get rid of the ivy, right? Some physical or mechanical methods that you can use are barriers and cages for the plants like um, berry baskets. I'm gonna talk more about these or milk jugs. Those, are, those can help. I'll, I'll show some other examples. These are, these are ways of excluding the pests from the plants. Do remember that rats and squirrels can chew through plastic, but they also might just go find someone else's plant if you make yours a little bit more difficult to get to. There are traps, um, especially for rats and gophers. One thing to remember if you choose to trap, you must do so lawfully and deal with the animal on your property, whether it's trapped alive or dead. You are not allowed to transport and release. That is illegal in California. Um, so just keep that in mind if you choose to trap. There are biological controls that you can use for vertebrate pests. If you do things to attract owls and hawks and large birds to your area, gopher snakes are fantastic to have in your garden, right? So make your garden attractive to other creatures besides just your vegetable plants. And then there are of course, chemical methods of control. There are baits and poisons. With these, um, with these control methods, there is, can be a serious problem with the unintended killing of predatory species, especially owls and other raptors. They also may sicken or kill your pets, your dog or your cat. So um, be very careful about that. All rodent baits are toxic to dogs and cats. However, certain baits and poisons are legal. If you have reached the end of your rope, Having tried the other control methods first um, without any success, you may legally use uh, baits and poisons, but always, always, always look at the UCIPM site, search on whatever animal you're having problems with. And if you use a chemical control method, the label is the law. You must follow the label exactly. And then I wanted to share this picture with you. Uh, it's a great example of chemical, bio, sorry, of biological control for gophers. The more wild herons, eagles, and owls we have, the fewer gophers, right? This photo was taken just a couple weeks ago at Marshall Cottle Park in South Central San Jose. Big heron eating a gopher. And I've seen this happen many times, actually. It's really pretty cool to watch. And this is a big topic. 
If you want to learn more about vertebrate pest management, um, on April 8th at five o'clock, the guy who took that photo in the last slide, Hank Morales, is going to give a talk on vertebrate pest management, and he's going to go into a lot more detail. And if you can't make that one, um, there is an in-depth class available on YouTube at these two sites. It's a two-part class. Um, it's pretty in-depth, but um, it will give you a lot more information. And we can't cover all the details, but I do want to go through some of the barrier methods that master gardeners have been using to protect their vegetable plants. And you might get some ideas for your own garden. So when you plant seeds or transplant seedlings out into your vegetable garden, you wanna put some form of protection on them immediately. Um, I've had many experiences where the plants don't even last one night without some kind of protection. For protecting seedlings from birds, berry baskets, milk jugs like this cut in half or other small barriers can work really, really well. These can also keep a lot of flying insects away and you do wanna take the top off. You wanna put some landscape staples through the edge to anchor it into the soil. And then for protection from rats and squirrels and birds, um, over any vegetables really, or fruits, you can make cages. Uh, these can be really handy and, and not too hard to make. And you can just lift them up and put them on top of the plants. And then um, if you wanna go all the way, you can build something you could walk into. This is a walk-in cage at our Sunnyvale demo garden. It works great to keep the rats and squirrels out of the vegetables. So something you might wanna think about. And that's all I'm gonna say about vertebrate pests. But now I wanna talk a little bit about something that's a very difficult for some gardeners is the issue of perennial weeds. So here's a picture that Karen showed us in our first class. I'm showing it again to emphasize that weeds are pests and they can completely overwhelm your garden. If the place where you plan to make a vegetable garden looks like this, if it is infested with perennial weeds, you must eliminate them from the garden before you plant any vegetables. There's no beating around the bush here. You must kill the weeds. <laughs> I also want to reiterate a point that Candace discussed in class two. Perennial weeds reproduce not only from seed, but also from their very deep bulbs, roots, and underground stems. Pulling off the tops or even the tops plus part of the root is not going to kill them. In the case of Bermuda grass, just a tiny bit of stem left in the soil can become a whole new weed infestation. Bindweed roots often extend many, many feet into the soil and they're virtually impossible to dig out. Perennial weeds don't die at the end of the summer like annual weeds, they grow back every year. Okay, so weeds are pests and perennial weeds are particularly nasty ones. We can use integrated pest management methods to deal with them. You can see the four categories of IPM as they apply to weeds. Biological controls for weeds are not generally available to home gardeners, so that category is empty. Um, again, the cultural and, and physical and mechanical techniques like using thick mulch, correct watering, hoeing and hand weeding are very effective ways to control annual weeds in your garden. Experienced vegetable gardeners use those techniques all the time, constantly as a matter of habit. But when you're preparing a new vegetable bed in an area that's infested with difficult perennial weeds, the two methods that we think are most likely to work are shown in red here sheet mulching and or herbicides. Since I don't have a ton of time here for details, I'm going to refer you to the UCANR and lawntogarden.org. They both have excellent descriptions of the process of sheet mulching, which involves layering overlapping sheets of cardboard over the soil and the weeds, and then adding layers of compost and mulch. In this photo, the person is dumping mulch over the cardboard to kill a section of a lawn. However, since you're gonna be preparing a vegetable bed, there are some adjustments to the usual sheet mulching technique. First, the top mulch layer should be appropriate for use around vegetable seedlings and plants. <clears throat> All right. uh, for instance, leaves or straw, or even a double layer of compost would probably be better than something like wood chips, big wood chips. Second, 
most sheet mulch instructions are for eliminating a lawn and they say you can plant immediately right through the cardboard. But cutting a hole in the cardboard to put a plant in will also let in light. In our case, we really want to kill the serious perennial weeds. So you don't wanna create any holes in the mulch and cardboard layers that would let in the light. To ensure the perennial weeds will not come back, wait a year before planting anything. It's a good idea to water the area regularly to help everything decompose better. Third, although much of the cardboard will decompose in a year, some of it won't. You should remove the larger chunks of whatever's remaining of the cardboard, um, install your irrigation, and get rid of any snails and slugs that might be hiding underneath there because they, they are gonna find that's a neat place to hide and do all those things before you plant any seeds or vegetable transplants. And then fourth, and very important, be sure that the roots are not being fed by shoot, shoots from the perennial weeds outside of the mulched area. You want to watch for any new sprouts and dig them out on site. Again, this can take a year. It takes a long time to be effective. And it requires a lot of materials like compost, cardboard, mulch. It can result in some really nice soil. I've used it myself and you can, you can have some really nice soil under there after a year if you, if you give it lots of compost and, and keep it wet. Um, but, oh, you may not have a year to wait, right? You may decide that this method is not for you for whatever reason. So in that case, another alternative to eliminate serious perennial weeds is to use herbicides. And I'm I'm just going to emphasize herbicides are not appropriate for use in a home garden where weeds are growing among your vegetable plants. We're only talking about preparing a site for a future garden. Also, I'm presenting this information so you can make choices to fit your preferences and your individual circumstances. This is not a recommendation in either, in any case. So the first step of course is to identify the pest, which is a weed, but what weed? Do you have bindweed? Do you have Bermuda grass? Do you have lots of dandelions? So try to identify the weeds that you are targeting. And in this case, the UC Davis weed identification tool can be really helpful. I used it just the other day for a weed outside and it was actually really easy. Um, and of course you can take photos of the weeds and send them to our help desk and our help desk folks would, would be happy to help also. Identification is important because all herbicides are labeled with lists of weeds for which they're effective. And if you don't know the weed, you can't choose an herbicide. You may not be able to choose an effective herbicide. It also helps you know what stage of growth the weed is in, which is another key to effective use. So it's a very complex topic and I'm only going to go into detail on a couple of types that we get questions about. So the first one is vinegar, vinegar. We get a lot of questions about vinegar as an herbicide. There are a couple things to know about it. First, vinegar is 5% acetic acid. It is a cooking ingredient, not an herbicide. The word vinegar for the herbicide is a marketing thing because people are familiar with that word and so they think the product is better or safer. Horticultural vinegar is 20 to 30% acetic acid. It is a non-selective contact herbicide that works by destroying the leaf cuticle and it rapidly kills the plant. Botanically based oil and soap herbicides basically work in the same way. It is tested and it is regulated and is very effective herbicide for annual weeds, but it is not benign. It will burn you if it gets on your skin and it can blind you if it gets in your eyes. So let's look more closely at this example label. For top growth reduction of perennial weeds and grasses, for control of established perennial weeds, retreatment may be necessary. These contact herbicides do not translocate into the roots of the plant. They only burn down the tops and deep rooted perennial weeds will not be killed. They will grow back. You could be deceived into thinking the weeds are dead and plant your vegetable garden. And then you're gonna find that the weeds are taking over again in a few months. So you might need to use it over and over again to really get rid of perennial weeds if you wanted to go with this kind of a product. Oh, I did wanna point out that it is okay to use it in a vegetable garden, it says that on the label. 
So we also get a lot of questions about glyphosate. It is certainly controversial. I won't get into the details, but if you are curious about it, I recommend you read the page here from UCANR on the science surrounding glyphosate. Suffice it to say, it is legal to use in your yard and it is considered safe by the EPA if used according to the label. And I include it here in the spirit of giving you options. This slide shows a portion of, the, of one of the product labels. Glyphosate is a non-selective systemic herbicide. Notice that it says it kills all types of weeds. Once absorbed by the plant's tissues, glyphosate works by inhibiting an enzyme that plants need for growth. Because it works systemically, it can take up to two weeks for the results to be seen. And since it is taken into the plant's roots, it can be very effective for control of perennial weeds, especially if it is applied when they are at a mature stage of growth. Note that it also says it may be used to prepare vegetable beds for planting. You might notice that this label says, don't use it for spot treating weeds after planting your vegetables. I think it says that because it, it's very potent and if you get it on your vegetable plants, it's gonna kill them, right? So once you're, once you're done using it, you don't wanna be using either this or a vinegar product and acetic acid product in your vegetable garden among those, those little weeds that pop up. Those you need to hand pull. So if you use glyphosate or any other pesticide, follow the label instructions exactly. Don't spray it on a breezy day and always be careful to keep it off any desirable plant. Okay. Let's summarize. <laughs> Garden as ecosystem, right? You want your garden to be a wonderful, alive place. The UC, um, use, the, use the UC IPM site, integrated pest management principles, identify and monitor your pests. Don't take action right away. Choose the least toxic and most ecologically sound man management method that will achieve your goals. Attract beneficial insects to your garden. I hope you're convinced of the benefits of attracting them. They are wonderful and they will make your garden a wonderful place to be also. Remember that pesticides can harm the beneficials as well as pest insects. If you have problems with vertebrate pests, the master gardeners are particularly fond of barriers and cages and you might wanna try that option. And I encourage you to do some additional research or take an, a more in-depth class on that topic if you have problems. And then I discussed dealing with difficult perennial weeds when you're initially preparing a site for a vegetable garden. You might use sheet mulch or you might choose an appropriate herbicide. So guess what? Next week, we get to start learning about vegetables. <laughs> so as I showed you earlier, we want you to visit the uh, Master Gardener website, choose a vegetable that can be planted in March look up that vegetable on the um, IPM site and check out if you can find any pests that affect that vegetable. How can that pest be managed? And that's something that you will learn a little bit more about in our cool season vegetable class next week. So I am finished with everything I wanted to say tonight about managing pests. I hope that was helpful. And I can answer a few questions. We have a ton of questions. Uh, gosh, just a ton. So <laughs> why, don't, why don't we get I don't, started? I can't promise. But... Okay. So um, there, there were several questions about row cover. So does it reduce sunlight? Can you no. keep it on all the time? Yes. Does it get too hot in the summer? No. <laughs> This is, this is a one thing you want to do when you buy row cover. <clears throat> I, what, I, what I recommend is to buy a very lightweight one. And it can be hard to find the lightweight ones because a lot of times when you Google row cover, what you get is frost protection cloth. And that's a heavyweight one. So aim for something that's super light like this. And it, it can just literally lay on top of seedlings and it won't even hurt them. That's, what, that's the one that I find is really effective. And you can just leave it on top of them until the plants get big enough that then they can sort of defend themselves or grow faster than they get eaten. Okay, soap. 
So, you know, water with soap as a pesticide. So people are asking, can I use dish or laundry soap? Um, should I use a commercial insecticidal soap? What, yeah. What's your recommendation on question. soaps? Yeah. So there are many homemade insecticide recipes online. Most of them involve some combination of water, dish soap, uh, vinegar and salt. We don't recommend any of them. Um, in fact, we recommend that you do not use any homemade method for dealing with um, weeds or any other kind of pesticide, pests, sorry, or any other kind of pests. Um, we have these magnificent, they've used that word a lot tonight, but we have these really great professional regulatory bodies in the United States that test and develop regulations on pesticides to protect our safety. And they do a really good job. So if you're going to use some kind of a pesticide of any, any kind, you should buy a product that has been tested and is regulated. If you mix something up in your kitchen and you start squirting it around your garden, um, you don't know the dose. You don't know the effective, uh, what effect it's going to have on your pets um, or the birds or other critters because you have no idea what level of stuff you've put in there that should be used, right? Because it hasn't been tested. Um, you could do more damage than you than you want. So we don't recommend those at all. Sorry to be, you know, <laughs> so, so negative on them, but I, I don't recommend them. Um, there, there are also several questions about glyphosate and neem oil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in some cases, they've been sold as kind of a cure-all for any problem in the garden. What, mm. What's your comment on that? So this is why the, the IPM principles include identifying your pest. It's, it's a very specific thing. You want to find out what is the problem. And once you know what the problem is, then you can find the right um, method of control that will work for you. You may decide that you don't need to do anything about it, right? So again, wait a while and see if the problem is even a big problem. It might just be a little problem that you just happen to notice, um, but it might go away if the beneficials come in and deal with it. Or um, you might choose to use something like neem oil, but you wanna make sure that the pest that you're trying to deal with is on the label of that neem oil product. Because if it's not on that label, you don't wanna use it. So be very considered and thoughtful and specific about your choices. Um, glyphosate will kill all weeds. It is a very broad spectrum weed killer, but you don't wanna use it indiscriminately. You want to decide if it's the appropriate product to use for your situation. Not a, none of it's a cure-all, no. And, and for those of you who've been following in the chat, I have been posting links in the chat. I believe you can, I set it so that you can save the chat if you want to, to your computer, so that you can get those links. A number of them are also in the handouts that you can access through the Master Gardener website. Okay, powdery mildew. <laughs> we got lots of powdery mildew. So powdery mildew on snap peas, powdery mildew on other stuff. Mm. Luda wanted to know, should he or she use neem oil? Rachel wants to know, should she just go ahead and pick her snap peas and they're gonna be done in a month? Can she just outlast it? And right. John wants to know, so his winter vegetables all have powdery mildew, but they're gonna be done soon. Should he spray the beds before planting his summer vegetables? So, so, so no, you, you don't, you don't, there's nothing that you can spray on the beds or on the soil that will stop powdery mildew ahead of time. Um, powdery mildew is endemic to our area. Everybody has problems with powdery mildew. And um, it's also, there's a different type of powdery mildew for different plants. So cucumbers have one kind, zucchini has another kind, um, sweet peas have another kind, snap peas have a, a different kind. There's all kinds of powdery mildew. Um, 
My favorite way of dealing with powdery mildew is the one that I talked about the most, which is to plant a resistant variety. That actually works quite well in my experience. Um, for example, I always plant super sugar snap peas because they last a lot longer before they get powdery mildew than um, a non-resistant variety. Um, powdery mildew does get worse in hot, dry weather. And um, there are, it has been said that you can spray your plants, you can wash the spores off the plants. If you, if you, like if you spray your plants frequently as they grow, you can wash the powdery mildew spores off of them and maybe the problem won't be so bad. I have not had luck with that. So I, I don't wanna not recommend it, but it hasn't worked for me. Um, generally what I do is I try to grow my plant strong and healthy and vigorous so that it can put out a lot of zucchini before it gets the powdery mildew. And then I eat the zucchini and plant something else. That's my answer. <laughs> and, and if something, so your zucchini plant, do you put it into your compost pile? If it has I powdery do. mildew? I guess, um, hmm. I, I think, well, I, I think the answer should probably be no. You probably should should not do that because that would, oops that would yeah I probably shouldn't have said that. I well, probably I have. always <laughs> I put mine in the compost I put everything pile in the compost pile because I figure it's endemic. There's nothing I'm right. going to do about it. Um, That's kind yeah. of what I thought, but yeah. I, okay. I think technically the answer would be don't put any diseased material into your compost pile. Put it in the garbage. Which, which brings up another question. So if a plant has a virus. Um, do you need to throw all the fruit and vegetables away or are they edible? And what would you do with the plant itself? I would put the plant in the garbage, not in the compost. Most of the time, if you have a bad viral problem on a tomato, for example, it's not going to produce fruit for you anyway. So I personally haven't run into the issue of eating whether it has a virus or not. Um, I would, if I thought I had a virus in the tomato plant, I would yank it right away. I mean, if I knew it, if I, if I could identify that I've got tobac tobacco mosaic virus, I'm gonna take that plant out right away and get rid of it. Um, I, I believe you can still eat the fruit. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. I'm pretty sure you can eat the fruit. I don't see why you couldn't because the viruses are plant viruses. They're not gonna hurt you. And they're probably not even present in the fruit. Actually, they're probably just in the leaves. How's that for an equivocal answer? <laughs> Sounds great to me. So how about aphids? I was admiring your picture of aphids on the first slide. Um, so people are saying they try to wash them off. They're not easy if they're stuck underneath. So any other hints on aphids? Beneficial insects. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough. If you haven't gotten to the point in your own gardening where you have started to see this change that, that comes into the garden when you start to have a lot of beneficial insects, I, I, I really encourage you to keep gardening until you see this happen. No, they won't cure everything and you may still want to hose off some aphids. You, you might even, if it's a precious plant, use some, some insecticidal soap in a few specific locations or some neem oil, you know, to really targeted spots. But once you get a lot of these hoverflies and wasps and um, teeny, those teeny tiny wasps and, and other beneficials into your garden, you will really start to see a difference, a huge difference in the level of pests that you have on your vegetables. So let that cilantro bloom, let the oregano bloom, let the basil bloom. Don't believe when you're, they say you have to trim off the basil, you don't. Let it bloom, make flowers, lots and lots and lots of flowers. And those beneficials will come into your garden, you'll start having butterflies, you'll start having more birds and you will have fewer pests, I promise. Well, and that raises an issue that Leanne is, is asking about. So she's heard that isopropyl alcohol can be sprayed on plants 
to kill spider mites and thrips. Since we use alcohol to disinfect, it seems safe. No, I want to reiterate. I'm sorry, I don't mean to be rude. <laughs> don't spray anything in your garden that is not regulated by the pesticide regulatory agencies. Don't go out and spray alcohol all over the place. Don't spray Dawn soap all over the place. Use products that have been tested for which we know the appropriate application rate and use them according to their label. That's the only thing I can say. Yeah. Isopropyl alcohol is not for use in the garden. And, and it would also, it would kill anything else that it came in contact with. As well. It might, it might, it might not. It might be entirely benign. Right. It might not do much at all. And then you've wasted a bottle of alcohol, which you could have used to protect yourself from the coronavirus. Um, yeah, now just, I, I really, the more I read as I did reading in preparation for this talk tonight, the more I realized how important it is that that the things that we use in our garden, the chemicals that we put in our garden, and, and anything that you spray in your garden is going to be a chemical, the value of the testing that is done on those, it's really important. Okay, so back to the hand picking. So we've got a couple of people who get the idea that we're supposed to go out at night with our flashlight and pick up snails or slugs. Yep. So does it really work? And how many nights oh, do man, they have works. to do this? <laughs> so it really works, but you have to do it um, until you get the population under control. And I lived in a place where I had literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of snails crawling around my patio every single night, many, many hundreds. And I just, I, I, over a period of a couple of years, but really one spring, I went out every single night and I picked up the snails and slugs, put them in the bucket with a little, in this case, I use a little dish soap. I'm not spraying it on my plants, right? I put it in a bucket. I put some water in a bucket with a little tiny squirt of dish soap. I throw the snails and slugs in there, they die. Um, and you can just throw that on your compost pile in the morning. But if you do that regularly, you will, A, you'll learn a lot about your garden by going out into it at night, and B, you will get that snail and slug population down to a level where they just won't be destroying your plants. But until you do that, um, you're going to have trouble. Snail and slug control is the low-hanging fruit of pest control. That's something every gardener can do. It's not hard. You don't have to spray anything. Just go hunt them and get them under control. And let me tell you, it's great for your kids and grandkids. <laughs> they love to be able to go out at night with a flashlight. Give them a nickel for every snail they throw in the bucket, right? They'll be rich. A bucket for five cents, yeah. <laughs> um, spider mites. So, so a couple of people have spider mites. One has spider mites on a lemon tree. Julie said she used to just have them um, through the summer, now they're on her peas and they seem to be getting worse. Um, where would you, where, where would you recommend mm. Julie, Julie starts, for example? Well, uh, again, back to the issue of, of attracting beneficial insects to your garden, they will help control spider mites as well. Um, I have not had a lot of spider mite problems myself, so I don't have a ton of experience with them. Um, I think that spraying with water is a really helpful thing to do because it does create an environment that's more moist and spider mites really like it dry. They like dry, dusty. So anything you can go that's the opposite direction of dry and dusty, which would be clean and moist, um, can, be, can be helpful. It's amazing what you can do with just washing your plants. Like my lemon tree, when it gets all buggy and insecty, it, I just hose it down pretty hard several times a year and it makes a huge difference. Um, but I'm sorry, I don't have more specifics about spider mites because it's not, that's not one of my strong points. So it, are there any um, oh. pest management? Oh, go ahead. Just one thing, uh, any, any, go ahead and look up spider mites on UCIPM for sure. That'll give yeah. you some great options. 
anything about pest management that would be different about when you're growing in containers? If you have a very small garden, like just a few pots and you're surrounded by gardens that are not very diverse and don't have a great, so you don't have a great ecosystem going, the, the attracting beneficial insects thing is gonna be more difficult for you. Um, I'll, just, I'll just admit that. Um, don't, don't be too worried about buying a little safer spray, you know, a little soap, soap spray and giving that a try if you're just dealing with a few pots. Uh, it's, you know, don't feel bad about doing that. That, that would be okay. <laughs> um, I can't think of anything specifically about containers, you can still use the UC IPM site and you can still work on the principles of identifying and monitoring your pest. It's just that since your garden is smaller, you don't wanna let the damage get too bad, right? So you do probably wanna deal with the issue sooner rather than later with a, a tiny garden. Does that help? Yeah. Well, and here's somebody who's got flowers all over the garden, but do they need to be in the vegetable beds too? So how close do they need to be? all over the place. Put them in with your vegetables too. That, that you can kind of pretend that's companion planting and it will definitely um, be a good thing. Um, but yeah, have, all, have flowers everywhere. As much as you can, you want, some, you want flowers around your garden, lots and lots of little flowers. Um, and, but you don't, you, know, you don't have to plant them in between every head of lettuce, right? You know, you don't have to be worried about it in that kind of detail. If they're in your yard, they'll, you know, if there's, if there's some oregano over here that they're, they're enjoying the flowers, they'll come over here and get the aphids a few feet away. They know what to do. <laughs> yeah. And, and Vita is asking, uh, what about copper tape for slugs and snail control? Sure. Have you yeah. Tried that? Yeah, copper tape actually works. We have a, um, on the, the UC Master Gardener Santa Clara County YouTube page, there's a, I think it's on our YouTube page. There's a little, um, very short YouTube showing a, a test of snails going up to the copper and they won't go on it. They, they really don't like it. Um, you can take that tape and put it around the bottom of pots and um, your raised beds if you want to. It, it's ex a little bit expensive. And it's difficult to keep it clean. That's the problem is that they need the surface to be clean um, because once the surface gets all covered with crud and dirt, which is going to happen pretty fast out in the garden, they can slide right over it. But it, do it does work. It does work. Um, let's see. <laughs> and finally, are insect pests around all year? <laughs> Um, no, actually, they are not nearly as bad in the wintertime. Many pests are inactive in the wintertime. They're holed up in, you know, in the ground or they're in a hibernation state or a, an egg state, and they're not active in the winter. So next week, you're going to hear that one reason for gardening in the cool season is because there's a lot less problems with insects in the, in the cool season. Okay, we'll take that as a positive note to end on. That's really all the time we have for tonight. Thank you so much, Louise. This has been great. Please be sure to see the Santa Clara County Master Gardener website um, for additional information on growing vegetables, links to the help desk, the online plant clinic that we hold the second Saturday of every month, and the handouts related to this course. Thanks to all of you for attending and all of you, your super questions. This has been really terrific. Um, we hope to see you again next week, same time, same place for session six of our eight part series on cool season vegetables. Meanwhile, take care, stay safe and happy gardening. <laughs>